So here we have a, a family of Hamiltonian systems. dx dt equals y, dy dt equals x minus x squared minus a parameter a. A is our parameter here. I'm claiming this is a, a family of Hamiltonian systems, but how in the world would I know that's a family of Hamiltonian systems. Is there a way to tell? Fortunately, there is. This right-hand side of the dx dt equation, as always, could be called f of x, y, although it doesn't depend on x. And the right-hand side of the dy dt equation, as usual, can be called g of x, y, even though it doesn't depend on y. But in general, it could, even for Hamiltonian systems. Remember how Hamiltonian systems were defined. The dx dt equation is supposed to be the derivative, the partial derivative of some function called h in honor of Hamilton with respect to its second variable y. And the partial of the, of the, of the right-hand side of the dy dt equation is supposed to be the opposite of the partial of that same function h with respect to x, or if you're using different variables as is often the case in applied problems, think of x as the first variable and y as the second. This is the partial of h with respect to the second variable in the first equation. And this is the opposite of the partial of h with respect to the first variable. Is there a way to tell that this is a Hamiltonian system, that there is some function h where this is true. Yes, there is. It's, and it's the way to tell is related to the fact that those mixed second order partial derivatives are equal. It's called the Clairaut's theorem. If this function h exists, and it, and it does exist in this example, the second order partial of H with respect to X and Y in either order is equal. This is always true for sufficiently nice functions H. Now there are some weird examples that hardly anybody ever thinks about where this doesn't work, but for sufficiently nice functions, essentially the second order partials exist and are continuous. This will be true. What's the difference between these? With this one, you are really calculating the partial of H with respect to X first, and then you calculate it with respect to Y. This one, the notation indicates to differentiate with respect to Y first, and then with respect to X. With these operations, you work from inside out. Here, differentiate with respect to x first, then with respect to y. Here, differentiate with respect to y first, then with respect to x. Yes, for sufficiently nice functions, these are going to be equal. And what's the relevance there? Um, well, what would happen if you took the derivative of f with respect to x? The derivative of f with respect to x, because if h exists, it is also the f is the derivative of h with respect to y, would be a mixed second order partial of h, this one. And what would happen if you took the opposite of the derivative of g with respect to y? You would get the opposite of the derivative of the second order. Well, two negative signs make it a positive sign you would get this, those negative signs cancel. You would get this mixed second order partial derivative. And if H exists, these are gonna be the same thing. In other words, the partial of F with respect to H should equal the partial of G with respect to Y if H exists. Now that's assuming H exists, but I'm really wondering, does H exist? If I assume H exists, then these things have to be equal. But if these things are equal, does that mean H exists? It turns out 
In nice cases, yes, it does. This is a sufficient, not only a necessary condition for H to exist, but it's a sufficient condition. Does that happen here? Are these things equal? The partial of F with respect to X and the opposite of the partial of G with respect to Y. This is a G here and this is a Y. The answer is yes, because they're both zero. Differentiate F with respect to X, get zero. Differentiate Y with respect to... Differentiate G with respect to Y, get zero. That doesn't always happen. You can have both X's and Y's on these right-hand sides, and it still could be Hamiltonian. These things could be equal. But in this case, it's really simple. Those partial derivatives are zero, and so they're definitely equal. That is enough to say H exists, but it's not enough to say what H is. What is H? What's the Hamiltonian function here? Well, if F equals the partial of H with respect to Y, I guess I better integrate F with respect to Y to find H. Will that completely determine H? No, we still have to be careful. H of X, Y, since the partial of H with respect to Y is Y, I guess I better integrate Y with respect to Y to find H. Does that make sense? The partial of H with respect to Y has to equal the function F, which is just a plain Y. So I guess this should work, but wait a minute. That can't be the entire thing because I also want the opposite of the partial of H with respect to X to equal this. I need a constant of integration. That's not really a constant, but just depends purely on X. And it's traditional to call it phi of X, but it has nothing to do with flows. That's just traditional to use that phi of X notation. I want now the other condition to hold as well. I want the partial of H with respect to X, the opposite of it to equal G. What is the opposite of the partial of H with respect to X? It's the opposite of the derivative of this thing with respect to X. That doesn't depend on X. So I got to differentiate that with respect to X and include a minus sign. I want to set this equal to the right-hand side here of the differential equation, the G function, X minus X squared minus A, and evidently integrate again to solve for phi. I can get rid of the minus signs, multiply everything by negative one, then integrate to find phi. Looks like phi of x is negative one half x plus one third x cubed plus ax plus c. But I can take c to be zero. c equals zero is fine. What that's telling me is the Hamiltonian uh, function that I'm trying to find here is not unique. Same kind of thing happens with potential energy in physics. You can kind of shift potential energy functions up and down by a constant. It doesn't really matter because what's more in, what's more useful typically is thinking about the the difference in potential energies, for example, the change in potential energies. C equals zero is fine. So combining this information, this right here with this, taking C to be zero, I get my Hamiltonian function. I think I'll put the X terms first. And I'll also combine, I can combine these two X terms. Did I make a mistake? Thank you. Yeah, I guess I can't combine those two things. This should be squared. So it looks like I get A times X minus one half X squared plus one third X cubed. Take C to be zero. Add one half y squared. That looks like it's my Hamiltonian function. How is this helpful? I will come to that. 
for the moment, let's verify that H is conserved. What does that mean? H is conserved. It's like total energy. That means that along a solution curve, H stays constant along any solution curve. And that's what ends up implying the usefulness of this is that if I can make the level curves of H with technology, it's hard to do it by hand, then the solution curves are going to be on top of those level curves because the level curves of H are where it's constant. How can I prove it's conserved? Assume I've got a solution. I'll write it as X of T comma Y of T is a solution of the system. Do I know what X of T and Y of T are? No, I don't. I know they exist, but the existence and uniqueness theorem, no matter what my initial condition is. But to tell you the truth, this is a this is a nonlinear system. There's probably no way to solve for X of T and Y of T explicitly. No simple formulas for them. They can be approximated very roughly by Euler's, Euler's method. There are better methods than Euler's method. They can be approximated, but they can't, you can't find a simple formula for it, except at equilibrium points, because then they'll be constant. So how is that helpful to make that assumption? I want to differentiate with respect to T, the value of H at a solution curve, along a solution curve. Well, how do you do that? Uh, it's more multivariable calculus. It's the multivariable calculus chain rule is what I need here. Just going to tell you what it is. I don't know. Do you guys prove it in multivariable calculus? Probably not. You don't prove much in multivariable calculus because you don't have much time, right? Kind of like the same in here. We don't have much time for proofs. You take the partial of H with respect to X, multiply it by the derivative of X with respect to T. I am mixing my partial derivative and ordinary derivative notation here. Is that okay to do? Sure. There's just symbols for derivatives. They're just ideas. I did mention before, I think, that you know, using the uh, the cursive like D here for the partial derivative notation is just a convention. You could use ordinary Ds. It's not really a big deal. It just highlights the fact that, hey, this H function depends on more than one variable. X and Y depend on a single variable T. So uh, there I'm using the convention of using ordinary Ds. It's confusing. Why do we do this? It's just convention, tradition. It's the idea that's important. So that's evidently, this is what I'm telling you. The answer is this is the multivariable calculus chain rule that I'm using. Uh, it can be kind of visualized. H depends on both X and Y and X and Y both depend on T. So ultimately H depends on T along a solution curve. And I can differentiate H with respect to T. The way this diagram is helpful is if you write out those partial derivatives along the, the branches here of this tree diagram, the diagram is kind of hinting that you're supposed to multiply the derivatives along each path and then add the results. It's hinting it because I'm saying it's hinting it. It's not an obvious thing that that's what you should do. You can, you can make much more advanced kind of tree diagrams for much more complicated situations. And the analogous thing holds, you multiply the derivatives along all the branches and then you add the results. That's the way it all works. But how is this helpful? Cause like, well, what do I do with this? Well, I guess I can differentiate H fine with respect to X and with respect to Y. And hmm, 
I guess I know dx dt and dy dt up here. Derivative of h with respect to x is a minus x plus x squared. Right, looking right there. What's the derivative of x with respect to t? Go back to the system. It's y. Wait, again, that's confusing, right? Shouldn't it involve t? Well, it's like it always is in differential equations. The t is always in the background. I'm assuming I'm along a solution curve, so I could replace each x with x of t and each y with y of t, but we just don't bother. Just keep it in your mind. Yes, these things do depend on t along a solution curve. But we don't need to figure out explicitly how they depend on t. We don't even need to put the t's in there. Partial with respect to y is just a y. Then what's dy dt? Go back up to the differential equation, it's this. Which is the opposite of that. We have to get zero. If you're unsure, go ahead and multiply everything out. This cancels with this. Use different colors here. This cancels with that. And I'm out of colors except, okay. No, blue. This cancels with this. Zero for all t. And I didn't even really need the explicit forms of the differential equations here. I could have thought about this more abstractly because I could have thought about dx dt as being the partial of h with respect to y and dy dt as being the opposite of the partial of h with respect to x right away and gotten zero right away. But I wanted to expand it so you believed it a little bit more perhaps make it a little bit more real to you. That's what happens with Hamiltonian systems. Along any solution curve, H is conserved. Now, different solution curves give you different values of H. But along any given solution curve, H is conserved. For any given initial condition, H is conserved. So this is helpful how? I mean, we could, we could make our phase portrait without bothering to think about H. We could think about equilibrium points and null clines and directions in, the, in this uh, vector field. But if you've got technology that will also make a contour map of your function H, then you might as well use it to get more accuracy. Define H. H does depend on A. So I've got a, <clears throat> a parameter A in here. I could do it like this. There's H. I could put the contour plot in manipulate to see how it changes as A changes. What am I making a contour plot of H itself? This has nothing to do with differential equations at the moment. This is just the level curves of H. Kind of pretty. As A changes, they change. Uh, lots of computations going on there, so it's not real smooth. I can add in performance goal quality, make it a bit smoother. For different values of H, these are the level curves. For any fixed values of H, they're the level curves for, for that value of A. Seems to be more interesting when A is negative here. The solution curves in the phase plane follow these level curves. They are on them. Which, by the way, made that problem on the uh, 
in class exam a false answer because it was I said it was a um, a gradient system it was constant along level curves. That's not true. It's a Hamiltonian system that is. If we want to draw the stream plot on top of this, we can do that. But we need to make sure we get the right vector field. So I'm going to show this with a stream plot. What's the right vector field? It's the system of differential equations. It's this up here. So I need y comma x minus x squared minus a. Do I need a performance goal quality? Maybe. Guess it doesn't hurt to put it in there. It's doing a lot of calculations to make these pictures. There we go. You can see the solution curves are following the level curves of H. As A changes, the level curves change, the solution curves change. Where are the equilibrium points? It seems like there's probably one right there and one right there. This one seems to be a saddle point. This one seems to be a center. Is that true? The X null line is going to be where the XCT is zero, which is where Y is zero, which is the X axis. Crossing the X axis with vertical tangents. The Y null line is where X minus X squared minus A equals zero. Equivalently, x squared minus x plus a equals zero. I just multiplied both sides by negative one. Uh, technically, we need to use the quadratic formula, but they are, for any fixed value of a, they are constant values of x. They're vertical lines. It's the quadratic formula. Get x is one plus or minus square root of one minus four a. Over two. You're going to have x no y no clines and along those vertical lines. You're going to cross those horizontally. They're going to be real vertical lines as long as one minus four a is greater than or equal to zero. One minus four a is greater than or equal to zero. So four a is less than or equal to one. So a is less than or equal to one fourth. It looks like one fourth is a bifurcation value, not zero, like I was initially guessing. We go to a equals zero here. Let me just type in a zero. Yep, we do have two equilibrium points still. It's at A equals one fourth that they merge into one. There's, there's one equilibrium point there. When A is even slightly bigger than one fourth, it, the picture is not gonna change much, but there's no longer any more equilibrium points. You can't really tell because the picture didn't change much. Let's go back to a, a negative value of A, say like negative five. The again, the x null line is the x axis. Right about here, you're crossing that with vertical tangents. The y null line consists of two vertical lines, right here and right about here, where you're crossing with horizontal tangents. Is linearization useful? Is Hartman Grobman theorem useful? We could try. It certainly would be useful for that equilibrium point on the left and showing it's a saddle point. But the one on the right, it seems to be a center, probably purely imaginary eigenvalues. Technically, the Hartman Grobman theorem doesn't apply in that case. But because it's Hamiltonian, it sort of applies. Because the system is Hamiltonian, the level curves have to be oval shaped near that point. They can't be like spiraling because that would mess up with the continuity of the H function can't happen. 
What's the Jacobian in this case? Go back to the partials of F and G. F of X, Y was Y, so you get a zero and a one on the top. F of X, Y was Y. G of X, Y is X minus X squared minus A. So differentiate with respect to X, you get one minus two X. Differentiate with respect to Y, get zero. To truly do a, a bifurcation analysis, we would have to analyze that Jacobian matrix at that value of X and this value of Y. Y is zero, so that's nice. But this value of X, and it would be complicated. Let's just do, do it at one value of A. Uh, let's say, let's make this nice. Let's say A is zero. That'll make that nice. In the case, A is zero. What are the equilibrium points? Well, the, the, the X null clines or the Y null clines are X equals one plus or minus square root of one minus four times zero over two. That'll be one plus or minus one over two. Zero and one are the X coordinates of the equilibrium points when A is zero. Y is zero and so the equilibrium points are zero, zero and one, zero in the case where A is zero. If we plug the left one, zero, zero into the Jacobian, we saw from the picture, it looked like a saddle point. We should get a saddle point. The matrix becomes that. Its trace is zero, its determinant is negative one in the TD plane. You're down there where it's a saddle point and the Hartman-Grobman theorem would imply that for the, for the nonlinear system, that is a saddle point as well. For the other one, one zero, we saw it look like a center. Probably what happens is we do get purely imaginary eigenvalues. Plug this into the Jacobian matrix, replace X with one. You're gonna get a negative one down there. Trace is zero, determinant is positive one. In the trace determinant plane, you're on the positive D axis where the linearized system has a center. That's not hyperbolic. Hartman-Grobman theorem doesn't apply, technically speaking, as stated. But evidently, because the system's Hamiltonian, it kind of does apply. In general, for nonlinear systems, if your eigenvalues for the linearized system for the Jacobian matrix are purely imaginary, which includes the number zero, if they're zero or purely imaginary, you might say, you can't use the Hartman-Grobman theorem. In theory, anything could happen. In the book, when you redo the reading, there are examples where anything happens. Section 5.1, beginning of chapter five. But because the system's Hamiltonian, solutions have to be on the level curves. It can't possibly be a spiral sink or a spiral source because again, that would violate continuity. Level curves can't look like spirals. because different spirals have different values. Your function wouldn't be continuous at the point. Near point where you have a max or min for the H function, it's got to look like an oval. System being Hamiltonian, solutions being on level curves means they have to be on those curves. They have to be, it has to be a center. Real quick, let me just remind you without going into details that Hamiltonian systems and gradient systems are related. I could also use H as a potential function for a gradient system. It would be a different system. It wouldn't be the same application, but I could still use the same function to create a gradient system. The X dt equals the partial of H with respect to X and dy dt equals the partial of H with respect to Y. It's a different system, different behavior of solutions though related, solutions would no longer be, H would no longer be constant along solutions, but would increase along solutions. That's the behavior of gradient vectors. In vector form, you could write this 
in this way. The level of drawing the level curves of H is still relevant. Solutions are perpendicular to them when they cross them, orthogonal. And there's something called the Lyapunov function that decreases along solution curves. And it would be the opposite of the potential function. H is no longer a Hamiltonian function here. It's a potential function. If I let L of X, Y be the opposite of the Hamilton of the potential function, then L is going to decrease along solution curves. H increases, so L decreases. And it's got a special name. It's called the Lyapunov function. But the last thing I'll say today is you should know there are nonlinear systems that are not gradient systems that still have Lyapunov functions. So Lyapunov function is a more general concept. Gradient systems and Hamiltonian systems are very, very special. Lyapunov functions are very special too, but they are a bit more general. Every gradient system has a Lyapunov function, but there are some nonlinear systems that are neither Hamiltonian nor gradient that still have Lyapunov functions that decrease along solution curves. 